TLDW, the game is overdone and poorly balanced. If you're on the fence about this, just replay Doom 2016 and wait for a sale. Okay, now that all the people who are just gonna dislike and leave have been sated, let's have a big boy talk. Doom 2016 is a genuine masterpiece of game design and having it be both a hardcore experience and a fun time simultaneously. Doom Eternal is labeled as a masterpiece on Steam thanks to id Software and Bethesda's marketing teams knowing how to conduct the hype train straight into pre-order station. Doom Eternal is a good lesson in success being the worst teacher. It's a good game, but since the predecessor was immaculate, id Software had no idea what to work on or improve and ended up putting their efforts into places where everything was already just right the way it was and therefore now it's all overdone. Oh and uh, real quick, I know I said one of my upcoming videos was meant to kick a hornet's nest. This is not it. In fact, I have to go back and rewrite certain portions of that video now that uh, I've played Doom Eternal. I had no advanced access to this game and uh, if anything, the video that's intended to be a real fire starter is going to have to come out a bit later, but I think I'll have the time. I look forward to all the lovely DMs I'm going to get between these two videos. Videos, which, by the way, did you know this channel has a Discord that's open to anyone? Perhaps we wanted this hashtag masterpiece so badly that we willingly looked past a bunch of red flags that were clear, present, and even brought up by a few people who were shouted down. The first red flag was that all the early trailers were bullshot. In fact, I learned that the term for a pre-rendered cinematic designed to try and fool a viewer into thinking that it was a real person playing the game in real time was called bullshot from id Software getting caught doing just that during the first E3 gameplay trailer. Remember when E3 was a thing? A second red flag was the delay and the later admission that the team had already been crunching for most of the year. Nothing good comes from extended period of crunch, no matter what that new person in HR says. Lastly, and I hate to say it, but YouTubers and media outlets not unlike myself were a part of the problem. If you look at all the media leading up to Doom Eternal's launch, everything was either a softball interview, or worse, the content was done right inside of the spider's parlor, so to speak. A lot of the YouTube videos showing off gameplay pre-release were admittedly done right inside of the studio with admissions that the devs were looking over the shoulders as the YouTubers played. Additionally, a lot of that content from the videos almost reads like ad copy, hitting all the talking points that someone in marketing would want a paid actor for a commercial to say, but that's not to say that the people who went out to id Software to get their early gameplay footage for videos were being paid to say nice things. However, I'm sure that everyone would certainly like to be invited back to their studios for more exclusive pre-release video content recording sessions when Doom 3 2 Doom Guy Goes to Universal Studios to get his movie rights back is up for release. <laughs> Now, this isn't to say that Doom Eternal is awful. It's just not the amazing savior of our quarantine boredom that we thought it would be. If anything, I'd like to get maybe seven of the 14 hours it took me to get through this back so I can get about two thirds of the way through another playthrough of Resident Evil 4, but you can't really exchange time like that. People certainly like it, and it's not on the same level as, say, The Outer Worlds or some other big disappointment. However, it is in no way a real contender for Game of the Year, unless... All the games that got delayed from Q1 to late in the year get further delayed into 2021 thanks to the need to fight off the Rona. It might get it anyway though because, let's face it, game reviews are a sycophant's paradise. If we look at the Metacritic page for the PC version of the game, we see not one, but two massive red flags. The first is that there's more than two full letter grades between the user score and the critic score. Maybe id the software throws really good industry parties. Maybe the major critics knew that tanking everyone's darling beacon of hope wasn't a very good idea if they wanted to avoid the internet hate train. Seriously, a lot of these critic reviews read like they're fighting each other to become box quotes on a game that they know is going to sell like hell. I can't help but notice that even Jim demonetized Sterling's son was being gentle on the game itself and focused most of his criticisms on the internet's favorite punching bag, Bethesda Softworks, and otherwise used kitty gloves on every other thing about the game in his Jim Pressions video. The second major red flag was that when we look at the user scores, which there's already a whole lot of for the PC version, we see the uh-oh curve. What is the uh-oh curve? It's when there's a polarizing disparity between the consensus of reviews, often signifying that either someone is trying to manipulate manipulate the score of a product in one way or another, or that a lot of people are willing to ignore a lot of good or bad stuff in order to maintain that their initial expectations were right, and to avoid, God forbid, feeling like they might have been wrong about something. 
If the reviews trended one way or another, this would be fine. But just in general, whenever you see this particular curve on any product's review page, the buyer should beware. All right, we're four pages of script in here. Let's actually talk about where Doom Eternal went horribly wrong. Cause everybody likes a callback. All right, let's start out with the ripping and the tearing, which is to say the core gameplay. The combat, it feels akin to getting too drunk when you're young and still learning the limits of liquor consumption, which has happened to all of us, let's be honest. It feels really awesome at first for like an hour or so, but after a while you get extremely disoriented and confused and you're starting to feel bad and you end up having a not so good time. You're somehow overstimulated and you have dulled senses at the same time. And I attribute this to how there's just too many enemies in the arenas at any given time once you're out of the early game. How can you tell that this is the case? Well, for one, there are at times so many monsters in the arenas that you can effectively make it your strategy to position yourself between low level enemies and the stuff that's actually supposed to be a threat because uh, they won't actually attack through each other. Enemies will like patiently go around one another. There's so much stuff going on that you can't focus on any one thing long enough to deal with it and you're constantly getting broadsided by demons thanks to there being so many of them and so many more constantly spawning that you can't keep track of them all. There's other problems caused by how much stuff is in at any given encounter, but we'll get to that in just a moment. In the meantime, we've got the same repetitive combat and the two big Ys, maybe a third big Y, and then we've got to talk about how this game is what's called Nintendo hard. So what is Nintendo hard? Well, it refers to a kind of difficulty that was used by a lot of old Nintendo games in the late 80s and early 90s, where games were made to be very hard, not so much to provide a challenge, but to make it to where they could drag a game with maybe a couple hours of content over 10, maybe 11 or 12 hours of playtime. This was less about a lack of creativity or laziness, but more about how, at the time, storage space on NES cartridges was measured in the kilobytes, and the SNES could get up to a little over 14 megs if you are feeling extremely ambitious. You either had to make your games very grindy or very hard if you wanted to leave your customers satisfied with what they dropped 50 bucks of 1985 money on for one of your company's games. Doom Eternal is 42 gigabytes unpacked and does not have an excuse for all the crap that it does. Exhibit A of Nintendo Hard, the Marauder. The Marauder is meant to be a mini boss and one of the demons made specifically to deal with Doom Guy. This would be okay if like the other anti-slayer demons he played fair. The Marauder likes to ignore clean hits that get past his shield because screw you, that's why. I'm okay with playing by the rules and only hitting him when he's about to attack in his very nebulously defined vulnerability zone if it wasn't for the fact that damage only seems to count if it's inflicted as he's doing the attack. Pop him with a salvo of micro missiles while he's attacking? Too bad, his shields will pop up as they're exploding and effectively negate the damage despite the fact that they're lodged in his chest and the missiles are behind the barrier of magical ignoring damage because screw you, that's why. You also eventually learn that the way to effectively consistently deal with marauders is to abuse low-level demons because he won't charge through them and exploit corners into fooling the AI into charging. The marauder also doesn't seem to be too interested in the job of slaying the slayer because if you chainsaw or glory kill an enemy near him if you need health, he'll just, like every other monster, politely wait for you to finish your business before resuming being extremely cheap. Now, let's talk about how the overabundance of enemies is a facet of Nintendo Hard. Waves of enemies will spawn on top of one another, making things even more crowded if you killed the wrong thing too soon, and you'll get cornered a lot because you were careless, but because there's physically no space for you to move, you're just gonna have to sit there and get rope doped until you get lucky or die. At times there are so many enemies that you'll get knocked out of bounds where you won't be able to respawn or fall off the edge, effectively soft locking the game. Game, so uh, have fun with that. Eventually you'll get the BFG and the other melee weapon that is basically a I don't feel like fighting this button, which the Marauder will also ignore that thing too. But even then you'll find yourself reloading a lot of arenas because there are just too many enemies to deal with unless you do it in a specific way because ammo is very limited and the BFG doesn't seem to effectively kill everything anymore and it feels like its effective range has been reduced too. Now about that ammo pool. Even at max upgrades you'll find that you have the same amount of weapons and the same amount of ammo types but now you have at times less than half the ammunition available to you in Doom 2016. As an example, the maximum amount of ammo you can get for the shotgun is 24 shells in Doom Eternal, whereas it was 60 in Doom 2016. Supposedly, this is geared to make you use all the tools in your arsenal, but for one, some weapons are much better at dealing with certain enemies than others, and of course, the good stuff is going to run out because they keep on spawning the harder stuff, and for another, 
If you have to use every item in your rotation in order to get through the mid to late game encounters, is that really having many tools in your arsenal? Or is that having just one tool in your arsenal because you can't do it any other way? Yes, you will have at least one tick in your chainsaw gauge at all times because it regenerates now, but half the enemies you fight are either chainsaw proof because no, I summon chainsaw deflectors. And in order to kill anything bigger than an imp, you need a full fuel gauge, which is hard to come by for most of the game. And lastly, before I forget about it in this Nintendo Heart segment, I'd be missed if I didn't mention that even on the default Hurt Me Plenty difficulty, all the demons in hell must live in pineapples under the sea because them suckers spongy. The issues about ammo or enemy overabundance wouldn't be so bad if things went down in a reasonable number of chain gun rounds to the face. This all eventually leads to a very repetitive core game where you will almost always shoot the bad things until you run out of ammo, but now more bad things have spawned, leaving you with low health, no bullets, and more demons than when you started with in the first place. Then you run away looking for a conveniently placed zombie to chainsaw and die a few times in the process until you figure out how this particular arena loops around and you can do a little circuit around the arena waiting for your chainsaw meter to refill, chainsawing an imp, shooting a bit more, running out of ammo, running around in circles again to chainsaw another imp that will perpetually spawn. I find it ironic that while well, in the last game if you were low on health or munitions you charge straight into the hordes of demons to refill your stuff, now you have to run away because your melee no longer deals damage unless you have a specific power-up charge and will only stagger enemies at best. Charging into an army of demons looking to see what looks like it's about to go down in a couple punches is offering up a lot more fun and a lot more creative ways to do things than running away in a circle until your chainsaw meter fills up because you can only do that to quick kill. I thought I was playing a Doom game, not soloing in a World of Warcraft expansion. And this all feels like a band-aid fix for not bumping up the ammo pool, which even though that isn't the case and it's more of an attempt to make gameplay more simulating, it misses the mark and is now embedded into the leg of some poor sporting equipment store's hourly employee. Seriously though, if a fully powered up auto shotgun is a thing, it would be a way cooler thing if we were able to use it for more than three seconds in the late game. And if we're gonna be nitpicking guns, I guess I'll also say that the super shoddy should be at least twice as fast as it was in Eternal, because I almost never used it based on how slow it was, and when I was forced to use it in certain segments, I was like, gee, I wish I had Doom 2016 super shoddy right about now. And as an insult to injury, if you die more than three times to any of the major bosses in the game, they'll start prompting you with one of the cheat codes so you can get through it, which I eventually begrudgingly accepted because I was sick of Nintendo hard. And lo and behold, I got him the first time with the Sentinel armor. Personally, I think that maybe something a little less than this Sentinel Armor cheat mode should have been Hurt Me Plenty mode, because while I played on Hurt Me Plenty, it felt like Nightmare from the last game and then some. The normal mode of your game should be the intended experience for your game, and if someone who has been playing shooters for nearly 20 years now has to take cheats to get through your bosses, which honestly, I died more to the Marauders than I did to both the bosses combined, maybe you need a fresh batch of QA testers for your balance. Okay, now before you type the obligatory too hard Hard for you or the Dark Souls staple get good into the comments, let's talk about how Dark Souls Hard is different from this. Dark Souls Hard is hard, but it's fair. Every pitfall can be avoided on the first go round if you're observant. Any boss can be beaten with patience and adherence to the game's rules and following the attack patterns. Dark Souls represents a carefully curated cat. You're a naughty boy. We just let you in. You want to go out now because there's no snacks in your bowl? Are you just a hungry boy? Are you just a hungry boy? Are you bothering mommy into feeding you? I'm leaving this in the video. Everyone on YouTube, the cat is being a naughty boy. Shame him in the comments. Okay, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Dark Souls represents a carefully curated challenge that is definitely punishing at times and will make weaker willed players chuck their controller. But ultimately, it's a challenge that can be overcome with enough determination and practice and is highly satisfying. I don't see how you can practice yourself past the insane amounts of screen shake that Doom Eternal has. Like, Jesus, even Planetside 2 devs must think this is excessive. Okay, to wrap up the gameplay portion of this video, let's briefly go over the big whys. First off, why in a game lauded for being the granddaddy of all modern shooter games, which then revitalized the genre of single player FPS two decades after its initial release, are we stopping between every fight to do 10 minutes worth of platforming challenges? All the double jumps and monkey bars are really cool in combat, if they happen to be part of your runaway until you get more ammo circuit, but when the player has to stop the flow of gameplay to pause and figure out what order of color-coded ledges he's supposed to jump on in order to get to the other side, it's just not good. This goes doubles in spots where the grips are a little sketchy. 
Second big why. Why do we have timed target puzzles in Doom? It's like the platforming challenges, but more annoying. Third big why. Why in Shrek Swamp do we have swimming challenge segments in Doom? They're like timed puzzles, but more annoying. All this stuff really doesn't help dissuade the notion that this game is using Nintendo hard to pad for time. Seriously, according to Steam, it took me just over 14 hours to get from opening cutscene to credits. And I feel like maybe six or seven hours of that was good, solid gameplay that wasn't bloat from the Nintendo hard or skimming through walls of lore text. Speaking of which, let's talk about the story now. Okay, real quick, I'm not doing a full anti-sponsor segment for this video because I wasn't planning on making this video and unlike Doom Eternal, I don't need to pad for time on this big boy. The anti-sponsor for this week is a certain mobile game that's very controlling about what their sponsees say, and it's nearly everywhere on YouTube because they throw buckets of money at everything and everyone. I'll take my dignity instead, thank you. End of anti-sponsor segment. Now, the story. The story feels very undoom like based on what Doom 2016 established, where our Doom guy literally throws away the exposition because he wants to get to the ripping and tearing. In Doom Eternal, Doom guy will just sit there while people exposit at him, including those who he needs to rip rip and tear right as they are well within ripping and tearing range. But no, they're just gonna stick their tongues out at you, call you a smelly doo-doo face and teleport away. And then you're just gonna take that because otherwise we'd lose out on a third of this game's plot motivation. Seriously, Doom Guy, the winter bulk has left you soft both metaphorically and literally. Next, we have all the little lore bits, which have also bulked up considerably, where each one would give you about a paragraph's worth of text, which started as scientific analysis and then got wild by the time you got to part three. Now it's all the third part and there's a ton more of it. The backstory to one of the levels in this game is 12 different segments that are each 12 walls of text and it all reads like a D&D campaign after the dungeon master elected to take intro to creative writing at an underperforming community college. Lastly, there's a lot of stuff that's brought up that's either entirely dropped or just undeveloped in the story. Why did that one guy have the charged up thing? And being vague to avoid spoilers for things that weren't in trailers, why is Samuel Hayden doing what he's doing now? What about Vega towards the end? What's gonna happen with that? And are we going to ignore the UAC the way it is now and how it seems that no one was overly concerned with how they started acting after the events of the last game? There's a lot of stuff that seems like it might have been better to leave it out rather than leave it in an undercook. I know that some of this is deliberately set up to to be sequel breadcrumbs just like there were in the first game, but in the last game it was subtle. Like, I didn't notice that this was sequel bait, but looking back, I realized that certain things in Doom 2016 were setting up for a sequel. But we gotta justify Doom 3 2, Doom Guy gets his movie rights back within the canon of this reboot, but sort of not really. Okay, let's get all of the nitpicky crap out of the way so we can get to the stuff that I actually liked about Doom Eternal. First off, the stupid mandatory sign into your Bethesda account, which it turns out I already had one of those all along, and now I'm annoyed because I didn't get Morrowind for free because I didn't want to make one at the time, which it turns out I already had. It takes all of 30 seconds the first time around unless you're a dummy like me, and they're even willing to let you quote unquote make an account from the login screen without going to their website. It's annoying. Yes. It's stupid. Yes. And I'd really rather have it not in here at all, but at least it's not Uplay or EA Origin levels of bad and obstructive. Also, while it isn't everywhere, there's a clear lack of polish in certain areas. There's at times animation glitches if you run into things too fast, like previously mentioned, if there are too many enemies near you, they can knock you out of bounds, and would you like to enable sticky keys? And also towards the late game, I had a few crashes, and at times if you tab out of this game by accident or on purpose, you'll be met with a regular cursor stuck in the center of your screen that sort of spazzes out for a bit, and it just won't go away, no matter how many times you like tab out and tab in again. Lastly, while this isn't a problem for you, Vulcan and Shadowplay do not get along well. Well, why not use the other recording thing? Because even though Vulcan Vulcan is a very well optimized thing to the point of where you have to update your NVIDIA drivers to play this game. You're still pushing the limits of your machine playing this and alternative recording softwares like OBS tend to be resource intensive. So you won't be able to run both at the same time if you want a decent frame rate on your footage. Out of the 14 hours and change I played, I was able to get just under four of them properly recorded. This is more of a problem for me than it is for you though, as you're just playing to play. Okay, so when I looked at my footage and saw that I had nowhere near near enough to fully make this video, I went back and replayed the game so that you'd have something to see. Which, if you see any crappy footage, that's because in order to make it play nice with OBS, you have to turn the game settings all the way down, and then you have to turn OBS's settings all the way down and do 30 frames per second, unless you want something that looks like this. Why am I telling you this? Because this confirms my suspicions. When I look back at the two-thirds of the game that I re-recorded, it was only about five hours 
of playtime, effectively meaning that once you get past the difficulty and know how to get around Doom's Nintendo hard, Doom becomes a 6 to 7 hour game instead of a 14 to 20 hour game. <sighs> this is the world we live in. Lastly, the UAC people are annoying and over the top to the point that it stops my suspension of disbelief for a bit towards the later part of the game. It's not a big nitpick, but it's there. Now, let's take a break from all this negativity and talk about what I liked about Doom Eternal for a bit. First thing that is great about Doom Eternal, everything that Mick Gordon was involved with. If Doom Eternal gets any awards in whatever is left of award season this year, I hope it's for OST. Mick made some serious weight room bangers for this game. Ah oh man, it's only a week and I already miss going to the gym. Secondly, the environments are gorgeous. Everything in Doom Eternal looks awesome, except for a certain shot of the final boss if you look at it too closely. And it made all those stupid platforming puzzles a whole lot more bearable because everything just looks so cool. Wandering around my little space sanctuary was actually pretty nice of a time and hell has never looked as good as it has looked in Doom Eternal. Speaking of the space sanctuary thing, Doom Eternal does a great job with references and Easter eggs. It's definitely not too in your face and they're all things that you'd only notice if you knew about it. And I stopped and laughed at quite a few of these. It seems that Doom Guy has great taste and practical reading. Too bad about literally everything else in his life. Finally, while they're few and far between, those rare moments when there aren't so many enemies that they get stuck trying to go through an archway at the same time, and the challenge is appropriate for the amount of ammunition and other resources you have, you can have a lot of fun. This is why I'm so bummed about making this video. They had a good game with a perfectly balanced challenge at one point, but they had to keep tweaking it and pushing up the enemy encount until it was considered a good time if you can get through a late game arena by only circling around a number of times you can use your hands to count. Yeah. I'm sure it's cool to show the suits how many AI bad dudes you can put in one map at any given time, and I'm sure that's going to be great for your Christmas bonus, but was it really worth it? All right, so this video was really depressing to make. I was expecting better of the nice boys and girls at id Software, but Doom Eternal was so disappointing that after completing it and assuring that I had enough usable footage to make this video, I've already uninstalled it. I really wish it didn't have to be this way, but at least I didn't pre-order the $90 version of this game to buy DLC that I don't think I'm going to like. By the way, I have no interest in multiplayer or challenge maps because if the strong suit of this game wasn't good to begin with, I don't think I have any interest in the secondary parts of this game. If you were still on the fence about Doom Eternal and you found this video looking for guidance, I'd tell you not to buy it now at full price, but instead to wait for the inevitable 50% off Steam sale come Christmas time. In the meantime, Doom 2016 is still a perfectly good game, and if you're looking for that over-the-top action romp, there's Dusk, and if you're looking for hammy action cheesy story goodness, I just got done replaying Resident Evil 4, which has aged like fine wine. Resident Evil 4 will run you 12 hours of time past and has a much better flow of difficulty than Doom Eternal does. Also, it's got a ton of replay value thanks to New Game Plus bonuses. Maybe give these games a try if you haven't already. Okay, so that's gonna do it for me. I wasn't expecting to make this video, but I'm a bit flush for personal time as of late, so I can be a bit more ambitious than I usually am. Extra special thanks to all my patrons, and I'll see you guys, uh, honestly, I'm not sure. After finishing Doom Eternal in the early afternoon, it took me just under four hours to do the first draft, a couple more hours for revisions, and recording and editing this has gone really smoothly even with the cat screaming his tiny little kitty lungs out for more snacks. I also don't presently have to worry about getting to work or going to the gym for a while, so in the meantime, stay safe out there, wash your hands, try to find a way to get some proper exercise while the gyms are closed, and enjoy this cat video. Excuse me, sir, what are you doing? Sir! Is this comfortable? I knew that wasn't comfortable because you're trying to fix yourself. It is a lovely day outside. And today is finally the day I clean the windows because there is literally nothing else to do. But what is this? I, are you trying to snuggle with Flamingo and Igor? Flamingo and Eeyore at the same time as getting your butt warm by the sun? Yes, that is my hand. It provides the scritches, which you don't seem to be in the mood for. That is a more sensible position. Look at that. You lost enough weight where you can sit on the windowsill again. I'm going to continue deep cleaning the house and everything else I can find because, well, I got nothing else to do.